when we confront Leo the Great's letter to Flavian, sometimes called the Tome of Leo, it is easy to pick up this dusty old text and to find it to be sometimes rather dense, sometimes cryptic. And yet, this document is a major foundation touchstone of Christology, the study of who and what Jesus is. Leo argues, pointing out texts such as Isaiah 11, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, etc. Philippians 2, uh, in passing, and certainly the Johannine Prologue, that Jesus of Nazareth is truly God and truly human, that he has two natures, a human nature and a divine nature, and they are united without commingling, without confusion, without mixture, also known as the hypostatic union. And this letter, once again, seeming on the surface to be pointing out some intricacies in the natures of Jesus, comes to the front because of an incredible story, a massive controversy that rocked the Eastern Empire and led to great divisions between the seas of Alexandria, Constantinople, and even Rome. The story goes that there was an elderly priest by the name of Eutychius. Eutychius seems to have believed that to prevent the kind of heresies that were arising after Nestorius, it was necessary to emphasize, perhaps to overemphasize, the union of the divinity and humanity of Jesus by diminishing the humanity of Jesus, saying that the human nature of Christ was almost consumed or assumed by the divine nature of our Lord. There is an apocryphal statement. Uh, perhaps it is true. It's something that is still debated in the scholarship that Eutychius believed that the humanity of Jesus was almost commingled or assumed into the divinity of Jesus as a drop of wine falls into the vastness of the ocean or of the sea. Naturally, this kind of argument, uh, which would become the heart of the monophysite heresy, of the one nature of Jesus, rather than the hypostatic union of Jesus' divine and human natures, this would lead to Eutychius being removed from his active service. But of course, he was in the premises of Dioscorus of Alexandria, and Dioscorus, as head of the Alexandrian Patriarchate, definitely uh, had some tensions with uh, the Patriarch in Constantinople. There is nothing new about uh, political divisions and strife between certain uh, ecclesiastical leaders, and this definitely occurred at the time. Well, Pope Leo heard about these controversies in Rome. And he wrote a defense of his doctrine, which was the apostolic doctrine of the two natures of Jesus, being fully human and fully divine. And he sent this letter or tome to Flavian of Constantinople. And turn up, there was a historic council, except this wasn't Chalcedon yet. This earlier council took place in Ephesus. And there, there was a bit of what we would call in uh, American slang, a hatchet job, where Dioscorus uh, refused to hear Leo's letter or tome from Flavian, where it was the clear intention of Dioscorus to reinstate Eutychius, and where there was hardly an attempt towards reconciliation. As a result, Leo immediately called this the Robber Council, and the Emperor Marcion, 
of the eastern part of the empire, not to be confused with an earlier Marcion, calls for a council, which then meets, called the Council of Chalcedon, and at Chalcedon, it is now Pope Leo's letter, read by, I believe, one or two legates, and the writings of Cyril earlier that are read out loud, and it is believed that they are in harmony. And Dioscorus, who is forbidden from attending the meeting, I believe is held in a kind of house arrest, um, is largely removed from power, and Eutychius is uh, stridently uh, removed from any circle of influence. And it is said at the council meeting that the teaching of Leo is as though Peter himself was talking. That the voice of Leo in his tome was the voice of Peter. And as a result, uh, there is an attempt at Chalcedon to see the role of the office of the Bishop of Rome as increasing. I know that this is not a class on the advancement of the papacy, but this is a massive step forward for the papacy. And as a result, there is a kind of championing of Leo's tome as the kind of theological system that, in a genius way, resolves the conflict. Now, this doesn't mean, for example, that there aren't tensions between Rome and Constantinople. In fact, there is at Chalcedon Canon 28. And Canon 28 suggests that the new heart of the empire is actually Constantinople, uh, which is later on rejected by Leo without any reference to apostolic succession. So... That could be a discussion in and of itself. But the focus of this is on Leo's tome and its influence on church history. So a remarkably important work of theology. It might seem kind of intricate uh, and somewhat passe to those who are not seeing the arc of church history. But this was a watershed moment in putting parameters around the language which we could use to describe the humanity and divinity of Jesus. And that, for many reasons, why we would call uh, Leo Saint Leo the Great. And I have not even mentioned how he repelled Attila the Hun, or uh, how he preserved the churches in Rome during the Vandal persecution. So, very interesting figure. So, I have to ask a question. And the question has to do pastorally. How can we apply this? And I would argue, when I hopefully in a parish context as a Lutheran minister, when I teach the hypostatic union about the full humanity, full divinity of Jesus, I think what I just did here, giving the historical background, actually is quite helpful in articulating the meaning and power of the, the weight of who and what Christ is in, in the debates in the early church. One could easily ask the question, how is this relevant anymore? All of these arguments that occurred, you know, well over a thousand years ago. How are these ancient discussions relevant? Okay, fully God, fully man, whatever. Well, it's very important. And we could see what an overemphasis on either the humanity or the divinity or a mixture of those two things we can see the, the errors and the harm that that kind of misreading does to the powerful nature of Jesus as Savior. And I would fundamentally argue that students respond and pupils and parishioners respond very well through stories, yeah, through parables like our Lord, uh, the way our Lord taught in parables as well as in sermons, uh, even better than long-winded explanations of doctrine. So I think giving the historical background of Dioscorus and Eutychius in a, in a lively and interesting way, uh, I think would be kind of exciting to explain that these councils were not what you would call uh, easygoing armchair events. You know, at, at Nicaea, there is an apocryphal legend, which I personally still believe, that Nicholas punched Arius in the face. Um, Santa Claus, the historical Nicholas, uh, apparently uh, had a, a bit of a, a row, an argument with Arius. Same thing here when it comes to Flavian. Um, Flavian certainly had a bit of trouble at the Robert Council of Ephesus. Um, I didn't have time to go into it here. 
There's even a story with Dioscorus, where he meets the Empress Pulcheria, who says, in my time, I remember an old man who was stubborn, referring to John Chrysostom. And uh, Dioscorus responds, and I remember how your mother wept at his tomb, which was a dig at Pulcheria. And Pulcheria supposedly punched uh, Dioscorus in the face, so that he lost some teeth and brought it back with him. Uh, and said, see what loving Christ has got in me, or something along the lines. So th these were lively councils, uh, lively events. So theology is not, not dull. It's very active. And I think if we could recover that, uh, it would make some of this material um, thoroughly alive, and as, as it is in our class, uh, and as it is in our reading. So I think we can, in the words of Joan of Arc, go boldly forward with that knowledge.